or install capacity, license capacity, how much was it? Anybody knows? Let me this company. 10 million per day. 10 million per year. Today we make 4 million per day. Yeah? We would have been jailed many times over if we did it in the last uh, in, that, in that era. And that is being done, and, and it's a debt free company. So it takes a lot of money. The turnover from capacitors is about 100 crores. If somebody was brave enough to put another capacitor company to compete with us, and I say brave enough because he will need exactly 100 crores of rupees to start and compete with us. Because this is a very tough business. The capital to turnover ratio is almost 1 is to 1. It takes about 5 days to make a capacitor. So it's not something that is very simple to run. There are many processes. All of them are mechanical processes, thermal processes, uh, vacuum is uh, used, so pneumatic you could call it. Uh, there is a lot of electrical processing, nothing electronic about it, except that the capacitor is finally used as an electronic component. So the kind of human resource we have is all these. We have mechanical engineers, <coughs> uh, people who are dealing with human sciences, uh, and of course electronic engineers on the application side and on the design side. So that's been the happy journey, and we are using this human resource than that, uh, to create other wonderful things. We said capacitor is good. Can we use the, what we have created uh, to do more? You know? So we have gone into the, uh, to give you an example, into the electric vehicle domain. We make chargers. There's a new bike now <coughs> in Bangalore uh, called Aether Bikes. We have a very exciting product. Uh, we're doing the chargers for them. Uh, we are doing, getting into a company that makes, uh, in a collaboration with uh, somebody from Europe, from Finland actually makes electric drives which will change hopefully the way electric two wheelers, three wheelers and four wheelers work, bring in a lot of efficiency, increase a lot of range. Uh, we have another company where we're working on solar technologies with uh, British counterparts, a uh, completely new way of making solar uh, cells or PV. You know that solar panels are nice rugged looking aluminium structures. Uh, we have found a way of actually printing solar ink, PV ink as we call it, photovoltaic ink, on very plastic. So I could have a sheet of plastic which on one side will be a solar module, on the other side is an energy saving device. So these are several things that we are working on, but that's not the topic today. The topic is how do you get 40 people 20 years ago to become a part of this journey. So I will stop there and now ask you, so what would you like to do for the next 30, 40 minutes? What is it that you would like to do? What is, are there questions in your mind or just comments? Top of mind, hey, if I get the answer to this, it will be worthwhile. Otherwise, it's better to close off. Yes, sir. How do you uh, motivate people at times of great odds? Excellent. Yes. How do you become 640? How do they become 640? Yes. How are you able to cope with competitions like Usha the Pastors, Siemens? Yes, yes, you are absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question because it gives me a moment to show off. We, we make and sell more capacitors than all the other capacitor companies in India put together. That includes Philips, that includes Siemens. Schneider is not, not that right because they make very big capacitors, electrical. But in the electronic space, yes. Usha was a competitor, they died unfortunately many years ago. There was another competition called Guyo. Guyo, a Korean joint venture, we bought them all over many, many years ago. Uh, yeah, so it's been, but I will answer all that. What other questions? Uh, any instance from HRIR issues that you faced? Yes, wonderful. Certainly, when you have 640 people, you will face some issues. These are God's gifts. When you have a challenge, when people don't think the same way that you think, that's an interesting moment. Yes. And what is it like, run, like running a technical company while coming from a non-technical background? Wonderful. Very interesting journey. Yes.
Let me try now. So I think it's best because uh, instead of trying to answer it, uh, let me narrate the story with, uh, you know, uh, as it rolled out to me. And I will try and with some examples answer some of the specific questions. And hopefully, in the end, you will have answers. Uh, and if there are still some unanswered, of course, we will have enough time for interaction. So, what do we do with these 40 people? You asked me in the first question, how do you motivate people? And I think that is the key of what we are discussing today. So, you all play some sports or the other? Yeah? FIFA just went by. Any football fans here? Yeah, I still play. I played in my own neighborhood with three generations of football players. I played with the kids, and the kids became fathers. I played with them, and now some of them have moved on to jobs and some of their younger brothers, so two and a half generations. And I still managed to play a little football. Uh, of course, my son tells me that I, I'm getting worse and worse, if that was possible. But then he gets it. So what is so good about this game? Yeah. What excites? Why do you play football? Yeah, some, come on, man. That's it. Try. I like to hear from you so that you are also awake. It keeps you on your toes all the time. It keeps you on your toes all the time. <coughs> so imagine if I told you that, let's go and play a game which will keep you on your toes all the time, would you come with me? Why, why, I had had a nice late night. Why the hell do I want to be on my toes in the morning? But you're right. That's part of the reason. Why? Why does? Why do we play football? Why do we play any sports for that matter? Adrenaline rush. Yeah. The challenge. Would you still play football? Sorry. Team building. But that's not what I play football for. I don't go out in the rain. Just find some random kids playing and start playing with them because I want to build a team with them. I don't. Right? If they change, yeah, there's uncertainty. But imagine that you were having, let's say, the five-day, uh, uh, you know, the, the very torturous test match that we just had in London was going to start. Yeah? So imagine that there was no scoreboard. Runs didn't matter. Would you still be watching that, that match? Would it still be reported in the newspapers? Do you think Virat Kohli would be working so hard to try and make some runs? Because there were runs in town. There is no scoreboard, nobody is keeping count. Would you play football? You might play for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, but I say let's go into an organized football league. Would you start playing football? I say, you are a team. I am the captain or the leader or the manager of the team. It's none of your business to know what the score is. Every time you are losing, I will come with a whip and I will whip you. Right? Or I'll give you a lecture. Every time you are winning, I'll say, hey, you are hired to win. Right? That's what the whole idea of putting the team together would. Would that motivate you to play football? So the answer to your question, sir, is how do you motivate people? First, stop doing the things that demotivate people. My sense is that human beings are naturally motivated. A kid who's crawling wants to walk. He keeps falling. Right? His natural ability, absolute same, no problem at all, that toddler will continue to crawl all his life. But do you know any toddler, toddler who, whether he had parents or not, whether he had support, whether he had, uh, you know, ayahs looking after him or a good play school, do you know any toddler who continued to crawl all his life? Something within him made him stand up. Why? There's probably no toddler who did not fall while standing up. Right? Or did not hurt himself. All of us have gone through that pain. But yet he will go through that pain. So my sense is, you don't need to motivate. So as HR manager, we say, how do I motivate this toddler to start walking? Hey, don't. You don't need to. He is motivated. The fact that he is a toddler, he will walk someday. We might encourage him. We might enable him to walk a little faster than another kid. Right? We might make it safer for him to stand up and not fall or not uh, have a very agonizing form. That could be the role of HR. But to motivate it is really not my role. And when I say HR, I mean leadership. You know, uh, everybody is involved. So to answer the other question of do we have, yes, we have a small HR department. 640 people, there are only three people in the HR department. There's an HR manager, an assistant manager, and an assistant. Basically, the job of the other two guys is timekeeping, salaries, pay slips, all that is done in-house. That's not easy to do nowadays in the computer age. And if you put the rules and policies simply, 
everything is very clear. What lead to get in our organization? We, most people are busy approving leave applications. Again, a simple switch. How do you decode your people? How was the journey for me? Very painful from being an organized general manager of a large hotel, everything I wanted to do, to get into a fairly unorganized small sector business where everything belonged to me. But there was one happy part immediately. In the organized part, whoever I became, there would be somebody I had to go and say, Sir, can I go and leave? It's my son's birthday tomorrow. My family has decided to go on a holiday, can I take a holiday? Right? The very good thing that happened, sort of the idea is to focus on the positives. When you move into businesses, I didn't have to ask anybody. I was my own boss. The harsh truth is there is that as, a, as your own boss, you take much less holidays than you took as a, an employee. Because you don't get the time. You're always working in your mind. You know, I always just think so. So, a devotee thing to me as an employee was why do I have to go? These guys are giving me a 200 crore rupee property as a hotel to run and to make money for the owners. They have given me their brand, which I can, I can destroy that brand in a day by doing one thing wrong with the hotel. Right? Allow something wrong to happen in my hotel. Uh, serve, uh, uh, serve state food, get people food poisoned. I could just be negligent and I can spoil that. But those people are trusting me as a general manager with their massive hotel, with that many employees, with their reputation and their money and everything at stake. But they don't trust me enough to take a leap when I want to take a leap. Right? So this kind of a demotivating thing we took away from day one. I told the 40 guys, hey, you are your bosses. Have the courtesy to tell your boss that you're not coming tomorrow. Right? But take as many leaves as you like. There is a rule that many leaves are paid for. If you go beyond that, they will not be paid for. Right? We will hold you responsible for the role you play. If you are a maintenance chief, are the machines being maintained well? Are you happy with how they are maintained? Can you maintain them better? Does somebody else in the world maintain them better? Right? So I run the organization like you play football. Lionel Messi doesn't need motivation. He needs to be just shown the next benchmark saying, hey, look there, Ronaldo. He's the real goat. Yeah? He just needs a benchmark to be put there. You don't want to tell him why, why are you waking up at 6 o'clock in training? Why don't we start at 5? When he sees competition, he will wake up at 4 on his own. But I could demotivate him by saying, Mr. Messi, every time you go drink coffee, you would ask me to sign a voucher. You would come to me and request for a coffee, and then I will sign it, and then you go get it. It's a perfect way to demotivate him, isn't it? So the first question is, how do we want to treat these human beings? Like I said, they don't need motivation. But how many organizations work like this? Yeah. So you hire a person. And you check everything about it, what is your family background, the psychometric data, where you come from, uh, where you get educated, which school, which club were you in, were you ever the class representative, you know all this. Right? Why? Because you're trying to get the best person possible. And then, during his under training, training, management training, whatever you call it, what do you do with, with that training period? You basically start saying, hey, you can't do that. You can't do this. These are the rules. This is how this has to be done. And in no other way. And the guy says, excuse me sir, but I have better. No, I, you're not here for ideas. Not exactly like this, it's good. But everything that happens in many organizations tells the employee time and again, when he meets for a smoke outside with his other colleagues, more senior, and he says, why are you looking unhappy? Right, today that guy called me and I gave him a good idea. He stole my idea and gave it to the boss. Or I gave him an idea, he just shut me off and he says, it's not your job to think. So without realizing, what we do is we hire the full human being. We pay for the full human being in monetary terms. But then we start telling him, you are hired only for your hands and eyes. Your job is to look at this capacitor. If it is good looking, you keep it here. If it is bad looking, put it there. But he has an idea. Why are there so many bad looking capacitors? That's not your job. You owe us to think. You continue to do this. And do you know, because you keep thinking, the other guys are doing 10,000 pieces per shift, you are doing only 8,000. Next time I catch you doing 8,000, I'll fire you. You'll lose your job. That is the normal context that we set for these employees. So we don't need to motivate them, but stop demotivating them. Which is simple in my opinion. 
how would I be if I were asked to do this job of sitting down and looking at 50,000 capacitors a day to find out if the marking on them was correct or not? Because that's one of the processes we have not been able to automate. Still, the human eye is the best way of looking at a piece whether it's good or not. And what are best we do? Of course, it's down to 0.001%, but there are still that 0.001% that needs to be segregated, which you don't want to reach the market. <coughs> so there is a job to be done. How do I make sure that a person, could I imagine myself for the last 24 years going and looking at that capacitor and finding out which is looking good and which is looking ugly? No, I can't. So I think the first word I would use is empathy. Try and put yourself in the place of that person and say, how does this guy's life look? And of course, we are socio-economically different. Our challenges, our realities, our opportunities are different. But how humane can I be? In making sure that somebody has to do those capacities. There's no getting away from that. And somebody has to do them very productively because this is not charity. I have to compete with the Chinese buggers who are doing one like a day. If my guy is doing 50,000 a day, I'm going to be reaching for this game. <coughs> but yet, I need to find a way that it doesn't seem so inhuman that a person for the rest of his life will only look at capacitors all his life for eight hours a day, sometimes on overtime, sometimes on a holiday, sometimes when his son is ill and his boss is told him, sorry, you can't go on duty. You have to stay here. And still he's looking at the capacitors and we want him to make good capacitors or segregate the good for Yeah. So the first lesson, I mean, besides the empathy part of it, make it like a quote, which means what? Show them the score. Everybody in the world wants to know the score. A little kid who's playing with you with marbles also wants to beat you at it. It's natural. These are human instincts. Human resources does not mean that I beat all the resources out of all the, 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 the normal tendencies out of that person and make him look more and more like a robot. The person who's checking the capacitors visually, why the hell is he thinking? Why is he smiling? Why is he laughing? Why is he wasting time going so many times to the toilet? If that's what I want, then I'm basically looking for a robot. Fortunately, science has made many robots and we should use them. The fact that I have a human being instead of a robot is an advantage. It should not be a disadvantage. Which means that that human being comes also with eyes, he comes with hands, he comes with speech, he comes with power to think, a power to feel. Can I somehow tie him up? So what did we do? If you're that visual inspector also comes and you say, hey, let me share the profit and loss of our company. You can imagine the visual inspector, a housekeeping guy, somebody who cleans the toilets, is sitting down and looking at the profit and loss statement. So obviously it's an awkward moment. That's how we started with the 40 people, drawing graphs like this. People who had not been to school were trained in how to look at a graph. Everybody knows, is it coming down or should it go up? You don't need to be uh, an MBA to know that, right? What is the idea? The idea was to relate to them, to the goal. A street urchin knows in football whether he's winning or losing. Somebody who's not been to school knows that 4-3 means I'm losing by one goal. Right? It doesn't have to talk to me. But hiding that scoreboard is what a lot of organizations do. And they tell you it's not your job. You're a visual inspector. Why the hell are you looking at uh, what profit did I make? So we started taking away the covers from the scoreboard, exposing that scoreboard. And scoreboard means not only my profit, but the profitability of my company. How are people in China doing? What is the productivity of people there? Can I show you a video of how the Chinese people are working? So I, we started getting videos from Korea, from Japan. We traveled a lot. We made friends everywhere. That's one of the things I learned in hotels. And somebody asked me, how do you do a non-technical job to a technical job? There are many things the non-technical job taught me. So we started implementing them. We'll come to some of those. So the idea was to get those 40 people to become owners to own the process, own the company, own the way of thinking, share some of the burden that we have. What if this graph keeps going down? When will we stop paying salaries to you if that happens? And what are we doing every year to difference? And slowly but surely, that purpose became a shared purpose. Here is an important. Once in a while, the team has to be called back and said, hey, let's now review the performance. Why did you lose? Or why did we win? We won this time, we were lucky because the other team was not so strong. But we won't win like this the next time. And then you start looking at the role of each people and say, you did a good job in defense. Hey, but you, you were our star forward 
and you are not showing the pace that you can normally show. Can you do something about it? But how do we typically do this? HR managers, you see, football, the manager standing there and then every time they show the board, yeah, substitute. And when the 10 is coming out and the 4 is going in, you will often see that the manager holds the 4 by his shorts. And before that guy's all warmed up and he wants to get into the game, somebody's holding the shorts, the manager. And he whispers something to his game. Always you'll see, he's giving him some last minute. What can be the secret that you're giving him at that point of time? In many teams, the secret is saying, hey, Mr. Balash, this is your opportunity. I am giving you only five minutes. Tell me that you belong to this team. And I will watch you very carefully. And if you don't make it come, you will be kicked out. That's the end of your football career. And the guy is dead in. So what will you do? Will you now play the role that you are supposed to do, which is what? Which is that somebody from a midfielder will pass it to me and my job is not to hold the ball but just to kick it to somebody else immediately. Because I am in an area where there is a lot of people coming. That might be my assigned role. But now what is ringing in my mind is what the manager said just two minutes ago. So if I just pass the ball, how do I show my skill? So I don't pass the ball. I try to hold on to it. I try to dribble with two, three people. I try to tell everybody else outside that I am actually a very, very strong player. And so somebody talked about team building. Teams, we are naturally people who can work in teams. But we destroy those teams by saying, out of these people, only four are going to go with me to my uh, to the next assignment. Only five of you are going to get promoted. So there starts, the team starts breaking down immediately. Because till now you were uh, harmless friends, having a good time together, might be friends for life. But just this one statement that, that I made, the one statement that the manager whispered into the ear of that player number four, has completely destroyed his way of thinking for him. He starts doing exactly what he was not trained to do. Because he's now fighting to survive. So the other thing is, don't make it a survival thing for every employee every day. Business is not charity, it's war in my opinion. Every day we go to war with our competition, with customer demands. Uh, at least that's the urgency, war is not a, is a negative word. But the urgency is exactly like it is on the board. You cannot afford to sleep, uh, that's, that's obvious. But in that journey, do I make everybody think of it as a war every day? Or you could do it once in a year on a present time. And you could have an allocated time to do that separately when you do an objective assessment. But if you have all 11 players in the team who are playing at that point of time or on a constant appraisal, it's not going to work for any team. So how do we do it with capacitors? 